Let us pray for inspiration. Spirit, Spirit of God, Spirit at the heart of all creation, Spirit at the core of our being, you breath of God rising within us. Awaken us, strengthen us, enliven us, guide our attention today. Help us to hear the message that you have for us. Amen. One of my friends in Modesto is an evangelical minister named Jim Applegate. Maybe you know Jim Applegate. He's, he's one of the pastors at Redeemer Church downtown. And recently, Jim very bravely challenged other evangelical conservative ministers who did not speak out about the straight pride event. Maybe you read his, his article in the newspaper, in the, in the Modesto, Modesto Bee. So he, he kind of called them out for not denouncing hatred against LGBT people. And he said the reason probably that they wouldn't do that is because for them, in their eyes, LGBT people are sinners. And if you took up their cause or spoke out for them, somehow people would think that you're condoning their sin, their lifestyle, whatever that is. And he said to them, challenged them, he said, you know, you can love your LGBT brothers and sisters. You can love them as children of God, created in the image of God, even if you disagree with how they interpret some scripture passages. Can't you do that? And I thanked Jim for his courage, for speaking out for the gospel. That's the gospel, right? We're all included. Everyone is loved by God, whatever differences we might have. And I, I told Jim that I, I'm kind of surprised that not more folks like him, with his more conservative faith, evangelical belief, don't say how much they love LGBT people, if, if they are worried about the salvation of LGBT people, you'd think they would be going out into the streets to find them and invite them to your house. They're the lost ones. We want to find you. We want you to know community. We want you to restore you to a community that loves you. You'd think that that's what they would do. But as I told Jim, that's not really what they do. <laughs> Generally, they want to dismiss and say, no, we, we condemn LGBT people, and so we don't want to be associated with them, and you, you wouldn't be welcomed here if you were who you were and being who you are. And Jim very sadly agreed, very sad. Jim and I went on to discuss today's scene from the Gospel of Luke. Interesting scene, isn't it? And I think in this scene, Jesus is actually challenging religious leaders, some of his cohorts, some of his friends, associates, for not loving people they consider to be sinners or in danger of being lost. Why aren't you loving them then if that's, if that's true for you? Why aren't you out gathering people up, welcoming them into your community so that they're found? And then he goes on. And he tells this parable about a shepherd who has 99 sheep, and he leaves the 100 sheep. He leaves the 99 behind in the wilderness to go out and find that one sheep that he loves so much. It's so precious to him. He finds this sheep, and he hoists it up, and he puts it lovingly on his shoulders takes it back to the other sheep and the community and the whole community celebrates. There's a celebration because the lost has come. The, the community's all together. The community is all together. That's what wholeness is. That's what God's salvation is. The community is together. And then he, he tells the parable about a woman who loses one of her ten silver coins. And, he, and she wants that one coin. It's precious to her. It's got infinite value, so precious, so, so full of worth that she lights a lamp and she sweeps the whole house looking and looking and looking until she finds that coin. And she's delighted when she finds the coin. 
and she adds it to the other coins, and then she calls all of her neighbors together and celebrates because they're a community. The coins are a community. They're a community. They know the love and the wholeness of God all together. And I think in these parables, probably the shepherd and the woman represent God. God, who's not satisfied till all the beloved ones, all people are together, restored to community, part of a community where we know wholeness and healing. That's what salvation is, where we know God. Hmm. Of course, in these parables, in telling these parables, Jesus is challenging the self-righteousness of these religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. Their self-righteousness, saying that, well, there are only certain people who are sinners. We're not sinners. Those people are sinners. They don't see that you're only lost if someone has lost you, if someone has cut you off. And maybe we're all sinners. And then I think Jesus says, kind of tongue-in-cheek, you know, 99 people who don't need to repent, 99 people who don't consider themselves sinners at all, don't bring God nearly as much joy <laughs> as just one person who discovers this opportunity to experience God's unconditional love for them and for everybody. And that's what repentance really is. Repentance means we open our hearts to God's unconditional love for us and for everybody else. And as Jesus says, the angels rejoice at that, this kind of opening, because this opening brings us to community, to a human home that God creates for us, with us. I think Jim... Jim agreed with me on that. We disagree on what the, the Bible says about LGBTQ people. We disagree very much on that. Our church, our church believes that the Bible isn't all to be interpreted literally, that you have to consider context very carefully. But more importantly, what you have to consider is Jesus the teaching of Jesus, the very spirit of Jesus, the life of Jesus. And any scripture text you look at, you have to interpret in terms of that teaching and spirit and life. And, you know, one thing about Jesus, his ministry was three years long, and maybe in the Gospels we hear everything important that he believes we've got to know for those three years, right? Right? And what does he say in the Gospels about LGBT people? Nothing. <laughs> but he does say a lot about not judging. And he does say a lot about loving your neighbor. And he says an awful lot about community. We are community together. A lot about that. And so that's what we believe. And we believe that LGBT people, Q plus, <laughs> are no more sinners than anybody else. And the sin of LGBT people isn't their orientation or their gender. It's the same sins everybody has, right? We're all kind of equally sinners. We all have the same kinds of human flaws, human shortcomings. We all have the same struggles, sometimes trusting, sometimes opening our hearts, sometimes reaching out to others. We all have the same struggles. We're all sinners that way. We're all the lost in that way, we, and we need each other. And so, all of us sinners, all of us imperfect people, all of us people who are just human beings are welcome here in this place. You are welcome. I am welcome. We are loved just as we are. This sanctuary. And on, on Homecoming Sunday, we celebrate that tremendous welcome that we know in this church. We know God's love and God's grace and God's welcome by the welcome that we extend to one another in this place. And we come here to experience that, to experience 
God's love and God's welcome and to be transformed by it, transformed from the inside out, knowing how precious we are, how loved we are. That love transforms us, opens our hearts, opens our minds, so that when we leave those doors, we let go of our judgments and our self-righteousness, whatever we might have it, and we attempt to build relationships, maybe even have meals like Jesus did. Remember, uh, the scribes and Pharisees shook their finger at Jesus because he had a meal with people and associating with these people. Maybe we need to have meals, build relationships with people we may consider to be in the wrong. Maybe that could be other Christians, more traditional evangelical Christians, like Jim Applegate. What if we did that? What if we, we know our beliefs, we know their beliefs, but we want to have relationships of respect as children of God? What if? Maybe those people would be people who have very different political views from us. That may be even harder. Um, what if we shared a meal with people of very different political views <laughs> and had relationships of respect, relationships of, of trust, of, of wanting their good? Um, one of the things I said in my blog this last week is that when you love your neighbor or you love your enemy, it doesn't mean you agree with your neighbor <laughs> or your enemy. It doesn't necessarily mean you like them. Uh, it may mean that you have to disagree and you have to say why. It may be that someone is doing something harmful and you have to try to stop that, but you will their good. You see that person as a child of God created in the image of God. And you check your own heart when it's closed and, and let that be a gauge and open it. So what if that, or any person whose lifestyle bothers you, <laughs> whoever that might be. And sometimes lifestyle just means how you eat or what you wear or what your house looks like. Uh, whatever it is that, whoever it is that we cannot recognize as a child of God, created in the image of God, is lost to us. And we have the opportunity to find that person. So the mission of our church doesn't stop at coming here knowing that we are profoundly loved by God and welcomed by God as we are, where we come here and discover a home, a spiritual home for all of us. No, we are called to leave this place and to create a home in our community and a home in our world for everybody. That includes everybody, even people we disagree with, even people um, we do not like, even people we might consider to be our enemies, to be able to come together. So we are called as a church to heal division in our world, and we know there's a lot of division in our world. There's so much polarization, so much judgment, so much division where people can't even sit down at a table together. And we are called by the gospel to heal, bring this healing, show a way to build relationships, show a way to end division. And the only way we can do that is to pay attention to our own hearts when we need to repent of our self-righteousness and guardedness Pay attention when our hearts need to open like those scribes and Pharisees. You know Jesus was telling these parables for them, right? The sheep, what does it mean for the sheep to repent? What does it mean for the coin to repent? That's just sort of thrown in. The people who need to repent in that seeing are the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees who don't know who their family is. And we also need to repent when we don't know 
so that the angels in heaven can rejoice at the community that we build through our lives and our church builds together. We have to pay attention to our hearts. And I think we have to sometimes say the words from the, the psalm that we heard today. These beautiful words from Psalm 51. Create a pure heart within me, open heart, receptive heart. Let my soul wake up in your light. Open me to your presence in the person in front of me, in myself. Flood me with your Holy Spirit. Then I will stand and sing out the power of your forgiveness. Everything is forgiven by God. All imperfection, and we're all imperfect. Doesn't matter. I will teach your love to the ignorant. The lost will find their way home. 